Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of New Books Network. This is your host, Morteza Hajizadeh from Critical Theory Channel. Today, we're, I'm very honored to be speaking to Dr. Simon Joyce about a wonderful book he published with Oxford University Press. The book is called LGBT Victorian, Sexuality and Gender in the 19th Century Archives. Uh, Simon Joyce is a professor of English at uh, College of William and Mary in Virginia, where he teaches Victorian and modernist literature from for, from Britain and uh, and Iron and LGBTQI plus studies. Simon, welcome to New Books Network. Thank you so much for having me. This is a, a pleasure to be on here. Um, this is such a wonderful book. I guess it's in a way it. It's 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 quite interesting when you come to find out that the issues that a lot of people are talking about these days, especially in the U.S., they're not so much new, and these kind of conversations have been had before, maybe in the 19th century. But before mm. we start talking about the book, can you tell us a little about yourself and how you came uh, to write this book? What was the uh, where did the idea, the first idea, come from to write a book about LGBT Victorians? Okay, sure. Um... This just depends how far we want to go back, I suppose. Uh, let's see. So, so one one sort of thread of this is I I wrote a book, what would it be about fifteen years ago, called The Victorians in the Rearview Mirror, um, which was sort of one of those early attempts to to think about what's now called neo Victorian studies, right? The ways in which the past is being used in the present um for a particular kind of ends and the way then the present is constituting the victorian past in particular ways um and so some of that was about politics and some of it was about literature and some of it was about uh film and you know all kinds of interesting things um and so partly one of the arguments i was making in that book is that is that it's very hard to encapsulate a period as long and complicated as the victorian period um and so any any version that we have of it is going to be partial and therefore open to um you know you know sort of uh individual interests and agenda right um and the thing that i i think looking back on that book the thing that the one part of our our sort of standard and so i've sort of interrogating all of our standard notions of the victorian right as you know an age of repression of imperialism all of these different things and the one part that i kind of didn't interrogate as much as i probably should have done was this idea that the victorian age is an age of sexual repression and so it, it sort of haunted me for for since that book and i kind of wanted to go back and correct that record somehow um and so part of the thinking of this book was just okay well so what one of the early things I had for the book was, you know, learning from the Victorians about sex and gender, you know, which was a sort of uh, the sort of handle I had for thinking. Of, so what could they teach us about these issues that we've sort of assumed for over 100 years now, they have absolutely nothing of interest to say. Um, so that was one strand of it. Um, the other strand was really sort of observing this increase. I think what you were talking about, this sort of increasing tension within the LGBTQ movement. Um, between particularly people who are affirming trans identities and people who saw themselves as primarily affirming a kind of sexual identity and, and this sort of increasing tension that was happening there. Um, and so the sort of political stakes for me were to try and think about why is that coalition, which in some ways feels very new, right? You know, we didn't really use there was an issue of like LGBTQ before I think the 1990s, right, is already beginning to unravel and and fall apart, right? And, you know, so I was kind of looking at, you know, what's called gender critical feminism in, in the UK and some of these efforts that there's now efforts to, to brand something called the LGB Alliance, which very clearly wants to kind of cut off there and say, these other people need to have their own movement. Um, so I'm sort of interested in in trying to think through what is the basis on which we yoke those two things together, right? Sort of, uh, sort of gender-based identities and, and sexuality-based identities. Um, and the one thing I knew was that that connection was incredibly strong in the 19th century, to the extent that in lots of ways, it's very hard to separate those two things out, right? For better or for worse, 
in the 19th century, typically sexual nonconformity was thought of as being pretty much synonymous with gender nonconformity and vice versa. Right. And I think there's all kinds of reasons why we moved away from that. Right. And then in some ways, the history of the, the gay movement in the 20th century was trying to kind of untie that knot. Um, but to the extent that we have sort of ended up back in that place again, I wanted to think, well, OK, why why were those arguments being made and what might be a value in those 19th century sources that could help us to think about our current moment? So it was kind so it was kind of um, wanting to take on board the ways in which certainly in academically uh, trans studies has has transformed queer studies. Um, where some of these same tensions have been obvious, right? Um, but in the way that the, the trans studies in particular has gone back and rethought the, the historical archives and said, you know, if we, if we look for people who have something that we would now term a trans identity, where would we look and where would we find them and what evidence would we be looking for? And it was sort of trying to do that, you know, and kind of, take that approach into what I knew of the 19th century archive and, and sort of think again about some of the things that we thought we already knew. So that's a kind of long-winded answer for how I got here, I think. But um, it, it really involved kind of going back over things that I, I guess I thought I knew and trying to think about them in a different light and from a different angle and see what happened if I prioritized in particular that kind of thinking about gender. Right. Uh, in your first chapter, you have three fascinating stories with three different case studies about um, three couples or three ladies. Let's say first one is the diaries of Anne Lister. And then you talk about the uh, a libel case um, that two teachers raised. And then uh, about two other ladies, Charity Briant, I guess, and Sylvia Drake. So there are. Mm -hmm. I well, unfortunately, we won't be able to get into a lot of details. And the, part of the idea is just to familiarize our listeners with some of the content of the book. But it would be great if you could briefly tell us, uh, introduce these three cases and tell us how they are interrelated because they, they, mm -hmm. they're seemingly separate, but there are interrelations. And all these cases sort of challenge our uh, our understanding, our norm normative, let's say, understanding of same sex desire in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Well, so so the, I mean, the, the first thing I was trying to do in that chapter was just simply establish a baseline for the, the beginning of the 19th century. Uh, so the chapter is called On and Around 1820, um, which is a reference to there's a famous essay by Virginia Woolf when she when she says on or about December 1910, the world changes. And it's this very deliberately provocative thing that Woolf says where it makes you think, well, why? What happened in December 1910? Did the world really change? Was everyone aware of that change? So I, I was sort of playing with that idea. And so I came up with these three case studies, all of which involve lesbians existing around the time 1820 in completely different parts of the world. So Anne Lister is in Yorkshire. The two teachers in the libel case are in Edinburgh. The two women, Charity and Sylvia, are in Vermont. Right. And so I, I thought I'd start by that and just think, well, so did these people have anything in common? Because first of all, they're, they're completely unaware of each other's existence. Um, although kind of interestingly, even since I've written this chapter, there have been interesting attempts to try and make them kind of aware of their existence. So if, if any of you listeners watched the series Gentleman Jack about Anne Lister, it has a scene in which she talks about the Edinburgh libel trial, which is happening at the same time. Right. But in fact, there's no evidence in her diaries that she ever read about that case. Um, similarly, Emma Donoghue just wrote a novel about Anne Lister's first lover, who's Eliza Rain, who was of Indian descent. Um, and one of the things she did was use the child in that libel case, who was also a child of Indian descent, to try and understand Eliza Rain's background. So there's kind of interesting ways in which like, we want these stories to have something to do with each other. Um, and so what I was trying to do in chapter is say, well, if we if we assume that we don't know anything about their connectedness, what connections can we find if we simply read each story independently? So I, so here's Lister's diary. Here's a court case. Here's the account we know of these two women in Vermont who live an incredibly happy, successful life um, together. 
seemingly free of, of kind of conflict and tension in a way that clearly didn't exist in the others. Anne Lister is subject to all kinds of abusive commentary her whole life. The teachers have to go to court to to prove that they're not corrupting the children in their charge. Um, and so I was sort of trying to think across those three stories and say, okay, so what what does something like lesbianism mean in 1820? Like, can we extract from those three stories some common themes that would help us to understand how women who love women thought of themselves? And, and in some ways, the point of the chapter is to say not very much. Um, so there were, there were sort of three things that I try and identify that, that you could connect the three stories through. Um, one is that each has something to do with gender variance, right? So in each, in each story, there are women who are thought to be more masculine than the other right, in partnership. Um, the second is that they all have something to do with class. Right, either the sort of class identity of the people involved, which seems significant in understanding their story, or the class identity of the people that they saw as appropriate partners for themselves. Um, and the third one was religion, you know, um, and in kind of strange ways that sort of plays out that that part of the success of Charity and Sylvia's life in Vermont was that they are incredibly tied into uh, local church networks, which clearly then has an incredible impact on the ways in which they can think about themselves as lesbians um, because they have a whole kind of biblical context of kind of worrying about sin and, and also about exposure, right? And so it's kind of an open secret in this small town in Vermont that these two women who live together, run a business together, uh, church elders together. Um, and so there's a kind of tolerance that happens there that's partly to do with the perception that they are devoutly religious in a way that doesn't really apply in the case of Anne Lister or those teachers, although in each case they um, they sort of speak a language of Christianity. They're, they resolve the tension between what they sort of understand to be uh, a religious prohibition against same-sex desire and their own desires in different ways. So, so in lots of ways, what I'm trying to do at chapter is to say, there's they have probably less in common than we might than we might think they do, or they, to the extent that they're thinking about the same issues and difficulties and problems, they're thinking in radically different ways. Um, that that wouldn't be the case if they if they somehow knew of each other's existence and could kind of compare notes. Um, and in lots of ways, I think what we tend to do is, is let's say, act as if they they could somehow do that. And so uh, the the book that does this incredibly good archival reconstruction of Charity and Sylvia's life, um, to give you an example, um, a place born called Rachel Hope Cleaves, she basically assumes that Charity Bryant is more ma more masculine than Sylvia Drake based on the idea that she must be a little bit like Anne Lister. And so she sort of uses Anne Lister to fill in what she doesn't know about charity. And in lots of ways, what's interesting is that there's really, as far as I can tell, no actual evidence that that she looked or acted in the way that Anne Lister did. It's just simply that we have a kind of framework that, you know, by the by the late 19th century would come known as the sort of butch fan model that assumes that one lesbian partner is going to be masculine and dominant and the other one is going to be feminine and submissive in some ways. And because Charity tended to run the business and Sylvia tended to do the housework, um, there's a sort of assumption that therefore you could read off their gender presentation from that. Um, and in fact, we have no pictures of Charity and Sylvia at all. So the only picture which I produce in the book is of a silhouette of the two heads each of their heads kind of facing each other. And I think what's really fascinating to me is that I can't tell which one is which. Right. So there's, I think, a 12 year age gap between the two of them. Um, but of course, with a silhouette, you can't see gray hair or wrinkled skin. Or, so looking at those, I have no idea which one is Charity and which one is Sylvia. Right. So in lots of ways, I think even from from that example, I, I sort of work with the assumption that they that we can't assume that they look radically different from each other or that their gender presentation has any kind of radical difference. Um, 
but if we sort of if we assume that every lesbian is a little bit like Anne Lister, then then I think that's what sort of the Hope Cleaves book does is saying, okay, well, where are we going to assign that particular gender image? Right. And it sort of assumes that one of them has to look like that. Um, and so in some ways, I'm I'm sort of trying to kind of think about those moments and say, well, what if we don't do that? Right. What if we just simply let the archive try and speak for itself and then see what we come up with? Um, and partly what we end up with is a fairly kind of incoherent idea of what lesbianism might have looked like and thought of itself in around 1820. So that's kind of my baseline. And then from there, I'm kind of, sort of trying to fill in some of the story about how certain kind of concepts and ideas emerge later on in the century that will try and kind of formulate those things a little bit more precisely. Uh, uh, I, I think it would be good if we could also talk about this whole category or it's a binary masculine feminine, because part of your argument mm -hmm. is that uh, part of the argument of the book is that it, it's not as straightforward and it usually obscures the same-sex relationships. Is that right? Yes, I think so, yes. That, that, that tendency to always break a relationship into, whether it's of men or women, into mm -hmm. one more masculine partner, one more feminine partner, is clearly one of the... One of the, the a sort of consistent through line of the 19th century, not in every case, but, you know, I think, I think there's always a sort of default to that. Um, and behind that are some very well documented assumptions about how we define the masculine and feminine in terms of things like active, passive, dominant, submissive, you know, rational, emotional, you know, business profession, caring profession, you know, and so all of those mm. assumptions run through so many of the figures I look at in the 19th century. I think in some ways that's one of the reasons why why we try to get so far away from from this model is because it seemed to have all of these really um, debilitating stereotypes behind it right? that meant then, you know, gay men had to be effeminate and sort of like sissy boys and and lesbians had to be butch and masculine, right? And, you know, and so I think all of those kind of assumptions emerge out of the 19th century. Um, so it's it's not helpful in that way. And so clearly one of the ways we, we now like to think beyond the gender binary. Um, and I think part of my hope would be that the kind of, uh, that, the non-binary students that I learn a lot from in my classes will ultimately go back into this historical record and and do a different kind of work that can kind of recognize and acknowledge where there's there are people who live in different relations to that gender binary and, and didn't see themselves as necessarily having to adopt this kind of masculine or feminine um, sort of dichotomy. Um, on the other hand, you know, that is the language that the 19th century used, and it's it's interesting to me that it is such a powerful language that they use. And, and so I don't want to dismiss it either or say, um, as I think some lesbian gay scholars have said, really what that's talking about is same-sex desire. And they didn't really have the language to say that, so they called themselves masculine women or feminine men. Right? And, but really what they're trying to indicate is is a, what we would think of now as sexual orientation. And I think that kind of argument has been used to to obscure the existence of people who I think did want to live an authentically sort of gender non-conforming life and, and, and don't need to get lumped into the sort of category of, of lesbian and gay. Um, but they're, you know, and that's what I've learned from trans scholars, I think, is to try and think as clearly as we can about people who whose primary interest seems to be in, in living a kind of gender truth, right? as people who are sort of consistently and persistently and insistently living according to a kind of, you know, what they perceive to be their, their true gender identity. Um, and I think we've tended to miss those people because we've been so suspicious of these kind of gender categories, if that makes sense. So I'm, I'm sort of trying both to kind of acknowledge and honor the language that the 19th century used while also trying to highlight that it's often one of the big problems of going back into the 19th century is that it's so essentializing and so um, oversimplified. Mm 
right and and so binary um uh, there's this character in the book carl heinrich ulrich if i'm pronouncing the name correctly uh -huh. uh, and yeah. he seems to be a very important figure who wrote a pamphlet called the riddle of man manly in terms of concept conceptualizing yes. homosexual yeah, man, man, relations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So can you tell yeah. us who he was and tell us about the importance of this pamphlet and also um, how, how he conceptualized the idea of sexual identity or homosexual uh -huh. identity yeah. in this case? Yeah. It's, actually, it's actually a series of pamphlets. There's 13 pamphlets. Yeah, that, that, that he then puts that sort of, you know, general title over. Um, he's a fascinating figure. So he's a lawyer who's working in Germany. Um, but of course, it's not Germany yet. It's a series of, of individual states. So uh, Ulrichs lives in Hanover and is a, is a lawyer and a gay man. Um, and so one of the things that he's trying to do is, to, is he's very worried about German unification, right? which seems to be very much, as we know, right? what's going what's gonna to happen in the 19th century is all of those independent states and principalities are going to consolidate as what we know as Germany. And, and so one of Ulrich's big concerns is that it's going to consolidate under the Prussian model. And the Prussian model is, has one of the most repressive legal codes in terms of homosexuality. Whereas Hanover, where he lives, and some other states, I think Saxony, uh, Bavaria, have much more progressive legal codes that, that reflect what's happening in France. In France, homosexuality in the 19th century is relatively legal and, and liberalized. Um, and so as a lawyer, he's trying to make the argument that we should follow the French model and not the Prussian model. Um, so he's the first person who ever makes a speech championing gay rights to a legislative assembly. Um, it doesn't go very far, but he tries to make an argument in front of the Hanover Assembly for why they should have adopted the more liberal um, and tolerant view of homosexuality. And the argument he's trying to make, this all goes back to the, what we were, your previous question, is that he's the person who coins the image, and he does it in Latin, but, but it's typically translated as a gay man has a female soul in a man's body, and lesbian would have a male soul in a female body. And so what he's trying to argue in a legal basis is that it's the soul that's more important than the body. Right. Again, in some ways, as Christianity is always believed, right, the body is just simply a vessel for something that, like a soul or a spirit, right, that is supposed to live on beyond the life of the body. So his argument is that that's the sort of legal argument he wants to make, is that who cares about the body? What really matters is the soul. And if the soul is feminine, then that soul, under the binary logic of the 19th century, is going to desire um, uh, somebody masculine. Right? And therefore, right, this is something that's immutable and unchangeable, and law shouldn't be able to prohibit it. Right? that there should be some legal natural right to follow the instincts of that soul in whatever direction God has endowed it. Um, and so in, in lots of ways, so he's often referred to as the sort of first gay rights campaigner for this, um, but also then the person who produces that model of the sort of, the sort of split body and soul, um, that almost all 19th century work then has to kind of contend with and either agree with or modify. And Ulrich himself modified this over the years in all kinds of really fascinating ways. Um, his original assumption is, again, by a binary logic, um, a more masculine gay man is only going to be able to be attracted to a more feminine gay man, or even actually even before that, that all gay men are feminine and are, can only be attracted to straight men, right? And that's the sort of starting point. And then, of course, he realizes that that's not always the case, right? That there are there are gay men who could also be masculine, so then he thinks, okay, so the feminine must desire the masculine, and vice versa. And then he keeps, I mean, what happens is, because as his circle expands and people read these pamphlets, and write letters to him, which he incorporates in the next pamphlet and the next one, what he's encountering all the time are people who say, Okay, but that's not me, right? I'm 
I consider myself a masculine gay man and I'm attracted to other masculine gay men. And he's like, oh, okay, then I need to create a new category. And then there's somebody who'll say, I'm attracted to men and women, and that doesn't seem possible in your system. So can can we have what we would think of as a bisexual? And he's like, oh, okay. And then he has to revise the system. And so then he creates this absolutely, what to something that looks insane to us now, set of categories that all have these very long German compound nouns attached to them, right? And, and, he's, and what he's sort of trying to do, I think, is kind of adjust theory to fit lived experience. Right. And and so, you know, people write to him from all over the world, and right, he's he's sort of, I mean, in some ways, he's he's his starting point is kind of Greek and Latin classical thinking, and so he's sort of increasingly adjusting that, and he's responding to legal changes and social changes, and recognizing that things that might make sense in a German context don't really work in an English one or a French one. Um, and so it's this absolutely fascinating sort of um, real-time version of what happens when you try and imagine exactly those categories and concepts that weren't available to people like Anlister and and the Scottish teachers. And, and also the idea of... Uh, uh cross-gender identity in the 19th century became a big um, part of male gay identity. That's uh, that's also how okay, it, it would be good if we could talk about that as well. Mm -hmm. Well, in some ways, you know, so if we sort of go back to, to Ulrich for, for a moment then, mm -hmm. um, what, what he, where he starts from is this idea and his term is the Bibling. So the Bibling is that feminine gay man uh, there's also the manling, right? The manling and the bibling, right? Um, and so as he's writing about the bibling, he reads about somebody, a contemporary living in, in Berlin, um, who goes by the name of Frederica Blank, mm -hmm. who was a firm male at birth, um, has changed her name, changed her appearance, um, petitioned for an official name change and for the right to marry a man. And and so he's so so of course in some ways for Ulrich this this is the person who absolutely confirms the things he's been thinking about right mm. and so in lots of ways Ulrika um, Frederica Blank becomes the kind of purest form of the Bibling right and he says in some ways we are all Frederica Blank we just most of us just don't have the courage to live the life that she has so in in a kind of fascinating way then for Ulrichs all gay men in this category are really trans women, right? They just simply haven't quite acknowledged to themselves the depth of that cross-gender identification, right? And only some people can. And so it, I mean, it's, so for me, it's really interesting because of course, you know, in contemporary discourse, we like to think, and people like the US Supreme Court say all the time, um, we never had this issue with trans people before, right? This is a new thing, right? These are new, these are new problems that we're dealing with. Um, and they're somehow the kind of product of some weird, you know, sort of something happening in contemporary culture, right? That might have all kinds of, you know, roots in, I don't know, media or whatever. Um, and in some ways, you know, again, the value of looking at the 19th century is that these are exactly the things that people in the 19th century were, were thinking about and talking about, right? Can Frederica Blank marry a man? Right? Can she be called Frederica Blank? Um, you know, there are other examples. You know, like uh, um, schooling. Can can uh, there's a kid in Wisconsin in around about 1910 who petitions to go to um, school under a firm gender identity, and they say yes. Right. We will send you to school with, and I can't remember which way around, I think it's with boys, um, but they were for female at birth, but it might be the way around. But again, none of these things are new at all. Right. Um, and so what's interesting is then to think about, almost kind of think about the historical sequence in reverse, where I think we've tended to think there were, there was a lesbian and gay movement that people like Ulrich initiated. 
that eventually kind of got to accept that they were such people as bisexuals. And then you kind of follow the initials. So we had the L, G and the B. And then those T's and Q's sort of came along later and got kind of folded into a movement. Um, and then there was the I, which is the intersex people who I guess we always knew were there, but but somehow kind of their latecomers as well. And so I think a lot of the gender critical arguments are to say, you know, it's sort of a uh, last in, first out kind of idea, right? Like, you know, you are kind of new arrivals on the scene and, and we recognize now that we can't really accommodate you in the way that we thought. So we would like you to go off and form your own movement and we'll go back to being LGB. But in some ways, the historical record is in reverse. Right. It's it's really and, and and someone like Ulrich's is one of the people that you can see this most clearly. It's thinking about things that we would now I think we would now label as trans and intersex identities is what allows him to theorize homosexuality in the first place. Right. And it's not the other way around. Uh, another part of your book that I really found interesting was uh, the idea of the idea that, and I think it's something that has been happening in uh, a lot of parts of the world as well, the idea of the decline of the power of empire and how mm -hmm. they kind of related to the, to the, to let's say masculinity crisis or loss of masculinity. You, you talk about this term effeminatus in your book, and then you show how this fear of loss of masculinity was actually uh, a reflection of concerns about the, loss of the power of the empire, the British empire. Can you talk about mm -hmm. this part of the book? Yes. Yeah. And I, I should say, first of all, that, that, that this is not, this is not an idea that that's mine originally. So I, I, I get a lot of this from a book by uh, a British scholar called Linda Dowling, who's written like a fantastic book called Homosexuality and Hellenism in Victorian Oxford. Mm. So her argument is that, that, that one of the things that happens when you become the kind of, you know, and this might be interesting to think about it in relation to the contemporary US, when you're the dominant superpower of the world, you know, one of the things that I think exactly you're getting at, one of the things that really plagues you is the idea that you might not stay there for very long, right? That there's an inevitable decline, right? That, that as soon as you attain that kind of global hegemony, um, you're at that kind of apex and you're about to fall into some sort of decadence and right. Um, and you, and, and that's the, that's the way the cycles of history work. And so in Victorian England, what they tend to look at is Rome, right? Because that's the most obvious parallel, right? Like why did the Roman empire fall? Why, why did it not manage to, to maintain its dominance historically for, for, for a long time. And so then they look at all of those examples of the late Roman em emperors and say, oh yeah, okay, so it's it's your Nero's and your Heliogabalus and, right, there's a kind of decadence that seems to first kind of manifest itself in in a kind of gender in, incoherence, right? So so there's a sense that, that one of the first things that happens is exactly that, that masculinity begins to break down and begins to become, again, as the term effeminatus is implying, um, effeminate in some ways. And what Dowling says is that this is not primarily about sexuality at all. It, it's, for the most part, not something that's coded as being queer. Right? The effeminatus is, is something like those 18th century rakes and rascals and hypersexual men, right, or effeminatus in the same way. Because for her, what the effeminatus is, is, is somebody, is anybody who's kind of strayed from what their civic duty demands that they should do. And the civic duty of, of, of manhood implies martial valor, um, self-sacrifice, subordination to the good of, of the nation and the collective, right? And so, so the effeminatus can just be somebody who is... Um, selfish and 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 pleasure seeking right and so what what happens of course is that at some point then that idea gets sort of alloyed together with same-sex desire and that figure becomes queer coded but i think dowling would say that happens relatively late and is, so that process hasn't even really sort of solidified in the 19th century and so so Certainly, there are there are sort of poems and um, uses of that term that seem to to 
accuse men of being effeminate that have no reference whatsoever to their sexual preference. And I think so. So the way I take this is to say, you know, what's interesting about this is that the the nation that's most resistant to that uh, sort of gender transitive model that we were just talking about in Ulrichs are people in England. And I think it's to do with exactly what Dowling's talking about. There's this really long-standing cultural anxiety about male effeminacy that has all of these other political and kind of uh, sort of social determinants to it um, that particularly seem to to run through the you know the sort of centers of power. And so it's it's among the elite that this accusation is most um bandied about and most dangerous right and so so what i sort of trace in the middle of the book is that there are these people in particular who are incredibly privileged you know go to private schools and to oxford or cambridge um who read all of that kind of classical literature and, and are also the people who are engaged with somebody like Ulrich's work has really had to know German to be able to read Ulrich's in the first place. Right? Um, and, and so, and, and so they're, they're in, in some ways, they're very excited about this because it gives them a language for thinking about their own sort of sexual desire. But what they really hate about it is the idea that, that they have to be necessarily effeminate to be out and open male homosexuals. Right. And so it's that part that that is absolutely a sticking point for these people like John Anderton Simmons and Edward Carpenter. And for that matter, Oscar Wilde, I think, is in this category, too, um, where in some ways what they try and do is strip out effeminacy from that model. Um, but in doing so, what they're also taking out is exactly, you know, the thing that has made sense of, of same sex relations, which, as we were talking about, you know, with people like Lister, was always to kind of match up the mas the more masculine and the more feminine. And so as they sort of strip out the idea of male effeminacy and say, I can identify myself as a gay man without having to then code myself as effeminate, um, they're, they're a bit lost as to quite how to position the sort of the logical partner of that now. And so I, so this is the thing I trace out particularly in the chapter on John Addington Simmons, is he tries all these other ways to try and think about, okay, well, in, what, in which case, if, if my ideal partner isn't necessarily somebody who's either more masculine or less masculine than me, how do I think about them? And so he, and he runs to a different possibilities. It might be an age-based model, right? Older men desire younger men and vice versa and that doesn't really work for him and then he thinks well maybe it's a class model um he has a the sort of upper class gay man maybe the object of attraction should be a lower class man and so that it, what's really interesting of course is and i think reading this from a 21st century point of view i think we want to say why don't you just not think in binary terms at all right like why does there have to be some index of difference that that dictates who the object of desire can be why can't they be somebody just like you right who just mirrors you right um and and what's so what's kind of interesting is that that seems to be almost an impossible thing to think about in the 19th century and so in in so is what they do instead is just keep working out different permutations and of, of difference um all of which i think if, if I'm reading Dowling right and reading the archive right, sort of comes out of this this initial phobia about effeminacy, right? That's what sort of drive, puts that process into motion in lots of ways. Um, th there is another person in the book, uh, John Addington Simmons, and he, yeah. he uh, I, I'm, I'm interested to know more about the, how he renounced the idea of effeminacy and also the category, uh, the, mm -hmm. the category that he created, middle earning, yeah, uh, why was it problematic, and uh, what other alternative visions of homosexuality or gender-based um, models he had in that age? Mm -hmm. Okay, so Simmons is one of the people who who reads Ulrichs, and you know, so he's trying to he's getting this language out of Ulrichs. So if Ulrichs, the earning is the general category, right? All gay men are earnings, um, or in a different version, Uranians, right? Is is one of the translations of that. 
Um, and then within the category of the earning, you have right the Bibling at one end and the Manling at the other end, right? The feminine and the masculine. So what Simmons tries to do, because he because he really doesn't want to have to think in those gender terms, he says, okay, looking at Ulrich's, what I recognize is I am the middle earning, which is the person right in the middle. And of course, what's what's kind of tricky about this is it's not really clear what the middle is, right? Is it a middle between masculine and feminine? Is it a middle between, um, you know, a kind of masculine gay man and a feminine gay man? Is it between men and women, right? But it, it's sort of this desire to say, to reject that system of sort of binary gender by saying, I am exactly in the middle. And I think what he really means by that is what we would just term cisgender, right? He is he's a normative man, right? Who's indistinguishable from heterosexual men that he knows and, you know, is at school with, teaches, right, interacts with, right? Um, but it's sort of the desire to then try and kind of, so he's both kind of accepting that there's a system here because he's in the middle between two poles that he has to kind of acknowledge form the the sort of parameters of possibility, right? Um, well, at the same time, kind of rejecting it by saying that he's he's at this absolute midpoint that then becomes almost kind of ungendered entirely, right? It's the person who 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 doesn't really think about gender at all. Um, and in Ulrich, this would be an absolutely impossible position, right? I mean, there is no such thing as a middle earning in Ulrich's. There, there is there is a category of somebody who kind of occupies that space, but only in a really kind of limited age um, category. And so I think what Simmons is doing is taking that category. Like, like in in Ulrich's, there's there's this kind of transitional period between and sort of about thirteen and eighteen, maybe that we might think of as adolescence, in which you can occupy this kind of middle ground because you don't quite know where you're going to fall out yet and what what simmons is doing is somebody sort of taking that and saying what if we can extrapolate that into an identity in and of itself right and that's the identity he wants to try and claim for himself because that way he is protected from all of those accusations of effeminacy right um but in doing so then he still has to think okay well so then who 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 can the middle earning desire, right? Because in some ways, if we have a a, a population that we've sort of divided out into the, the manling and the vibling, then there is no logical object of desire for the middle, the middle person, right? And so in some ways, this is where he kind of moves into the age differentiation model and says, okay, maybe, maybe my object of desire is that person of adolescence who is not yet defined for themselves and therefore is also somehow in that middle ground. And of course, that's incredibly problematic because he's a teacher and a university professor. Um, so, you know, relationships with teenagers is problematic in all kinds of ways. And so, um, like a lot of people of his class and background, he then tries to imagine some kind of version of a, a sort of chaste homosexual identity that can desire those people but not in a kind of physical way um that leads him to a, a sort of physical breakdown um that he says is you know like he he suffers this absolute breakdown of his health that he says is caused by exactly that those kind of forms of repression right because you know doctors have performed all kinds of really nasty surgeries on him to try and basically kind of to to eradicate his homosexual urges, right, with, at, at his own, with his own acknowledgement, right? And so his health gets so bad that he then moves to Switzerland, because I think, the, you know, the idea is always in the 19th century that healthy mountain fresh air is the thing that will cure you. Um, so he goes and lives in Switzerland with his wife and daughters. Um, what that does is bring him in proximity with, with Italy in particular. And so then he, he spends increasing time in, in Venice and eventually, you know, becomes uh, lovers with a Venetian gondola, uh, you know, the gondoliers, right, who, you know, go on the canals. Um, in which case he's then moved into this other kind of category where it's now a kind of class differentiated model that he seems to be working on. That, yeah. Um, so he's an incredibly complicated figure, right? And we know all this because he wrote a memoir 
you know, short, you know, in the last years of his life, um, that he had no expectation would ever, you know, survive into print, but miraculously has, and and was sort of published first in in kind of um, in quite um, edited ways, right? And now we have a full text. So, so you again, you can sort of trace out all of these kind of complicated mental moves that he's doing to try and think about his identity that they're in some ways reminiscent of the things that Ulrichs is doing in those kind of category shifts and changes. He's kind of trying to, to work out a way in which he can think of himself. Um, that, that it is partly about wanting to be an ethical person. Like he doesn't like the idea that, that, you know, his lovers become these, you know, particularly working class people um, because he's got to pay for them. Right. I mean, he, you know, and so he doesn't like that. He, I mean, he's clearly very troubled by the the desire he has for people younger than himself, right? And so, so what? What's it, it's incredibly complicated and sometimes quite heartbreaking to read those memoirs because he's sort of struggling so much through all of these categories. And I say you just want to say to him now, like, just just don't 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 think in category terms, right? Like like don't think there has to be. A category of of man that that you're allowed to desire, right? But again, that's the thing that I think the ninth century really struggles with, right? And and maybe is getting to at the end of the century or at the end of my book, I'm sort of trying to say, okay, maybe this is where we could see this, yeah. but in in you know pornographic text, which is a mm -hmm. whole different story. But yeah, uh, how about Edward Carpenter? He came up with this uh, another model of sexuality as a third sex, and uh -huh. um, I think I, and another part of the book that I really liked was you talk about mm -hmm. how the British sexology, I don't know if saying moved away from the German influence is mm -hmm. the right way of putting it or not, but you were the expert, so I'll let you explain. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Well, so, yeah, so that, I mean, there's a kind of, like some of this is, is I think, part of the, you know, sort of English academic culture, right? Um, there's a woman called Heike Bauer who writes about this, and, and she says, you know, what, what we have in England is what she calls literary sexual, sexology, because all these people are trained as literary scholars and poets. Um, and in Germany, these people are social scientists, right? And so it's all about quantification and uh, studying populations and statistical breakdowns, and, right? Um, so the idea of the third sex comes from the German, it's from... Um, well, so Ulrichs has an idea of the third sex very early on that he doesn't fully develop, but gets, I think, developed more by Magnus Hirschfeld in Germany. Um, and so Carpenter is another of those people who's reading this German stuff, and he's sort of trying to figure out, okay, what can I do with this? And and I, and I think for me, what's interesting about Carpenter as opposed to Simmons is he's much more open to thinking about gender. Um, partly because he's much more in conversation with um, progressive feminists of the time. Um, Carpenter identifies he's a socialist. Um, he's an activist for all kinds of causes, right? By vegetarianism, Eastern religion. Um, you know, he, he's sort of one of those people who's interested in everything, right? Um, but partly because of that, he's really interested in the gender question. Right. And so so for him, that's, I think, his way of kind of um, rejecting that that sort of knee jerk opposition to the feminatus that that I see in Simmons in particular. And so for him, like, something like the the female soul in the male body makes more sense, at least right, than it does for Simmons, because for Simmons to, to acknowledge any kind of effeminacy even at the level of something internal and invisible, I think it's too much. But for Carpenter, I think he's much more willing to, to entertain that idea and think about, well, in what ways might that help us in the larger struggle to break down gender polarity in the late 19th century, right? To respond to all the critiques of, of sort of feminist new women that he's reading and engaged with. And so for him, I think it's more about connecting those two things together. Uh, and um, when I when I came across the book first, I my idea was maybe to read a lot about Oscar Wilde, but I'm glad I okay. didn't because uh -huh. you also make the point that when it comes to the idea of 
homosexuality or LGBTQ in, in the Victorian time, Oscar Wilde kind of dominates all the discussions. But you have all these different kinds of cases, categories of people who uh, don't really identify as male or female, which mm -hmm. sort of... Uh, you know, gives us an alternative history. And uh, how how did the trial of Oscar Wilde here affect uh, Carpenter and his work? Oh, in, in very direct ways. This is this is quite fascinating. So, um, so Carpenter leaves Cambridge and he goes to the north of England and he's doing what's called the university extension lectures, which is basically lecturing to working class audiences, sort of taking the things he's learned at Cambridge and finding a way to articulate those things for a working class audience. Um, so he, he sort of, he buys a home outside of Sheffield, uh, which he shares with a series of, of men. Um, and he's doing this lecturing. And so he's, so in the early part of the, of the 1890s, he's giving a series of lectures on uh, basically sort of sex and gender. Um, one of which, and which each get published then as pamphlets. Um, and it seems very clear that he's imagining that these are going to be a book. Um, and there's eventually a book called Love's Coming of Age that he publishes that, that is in, in some ways the kind of product of that. Um, but one of those pamphlets is something called Homogenic Love, which is, you know, by some standards, the first published advocacy for homosexuality in English. Um, and he and he's, he's giving that lecture and he publishes that pamphlet just before the Oscar Wilde trial. And so what happens is, and and so he he's always claimed he claimed in letters that this was never intended to be part of the book that he was imagining, but all the publishers that he's talking to say we can't publish that book now because of the wild trial because if if there's anything in that about homogenic love then that that's not going to fly, right? Um, and so I mean he sees this absolute sort of panic happening around the wild trial that's absolutely taking up all the oxygen, right? And, and there's no way that you can do any kind of advocacy work about homosexuality in in the sort of shadow of the things that are happening in the wild trial, because it's just too big and too, too sort of public uh, a scandal, right? And for Carpenter, this is part, partly a North-South thing, he thinks, you know, like, something is happening in London that's now having this huge impact on the work that I can do up here in the north of England. So he has to basically sort of rethink that book. And you can see all this because, you know, his manuscripts are all readily available. They've now been digitized because you used to have to go to Sheffield and look at them. But you can see all the ways that he's then rewriting all of those pamphlets. And when he does the cabbage grace, he actually literally physically takes the, the printed pamphlet and he'll start writing over it in, in pencil. And, and making the changes that he wants. Um, and so the, the sort of upshot of this is that when the book finally comes out, Love Coming of Age, which is about 10 years after the Wild Trial, it's completely different than the way that he imagined it first. So the the pamphlet on homogenic love that was seemed like it was originally going to be part of it has sort of now been jettisoned for a completely different um, essay that he's written, which eventually becomes called The Intermediate Sex, which again is sort of the third sex idea and it's much more positive about those german thinkers than he was originally so lots more sort of prominence given to ulrich's ideas and hirschfeld's ideas right? so my sense is that what happens is that it's the the world trial basically forces him to have to think in different ways right it, what he recognizes in the world trial is a certain kind of queer advocacy isn't going to work Right. And I, and I think in particular of, of this, you know, the famous speech that Wilde makes when he's asked in the trial, you know, what is the love that dare not speak his name? And he gives this absolutely sort of classical defense of Greek pederasty, right, that, that comes all the way back from Plato. Right? And he says, you know, it is something that is noble and intellectual. It can trace its roots back to Plato's philosophy. It's there in Shakespeare's sonnets. It's there in Michelangelo. And right? um, it's right. It's pure and beautiful. It exists between an older man and a younger man. And there's nothing base or or sexual about it. And and in some ways, this this is the argument that people like Carpenter and Simmons grew up with. Right, this is what they would have learned in those public schools and at Oxford and Cambridge. Right, 
um, is a whole intellectual rationale based in the sort of ancient Greek, particularly Plato's work. Um, and I think the point about the wild child is that that argument doesn't work, right? Rhetorically, it works great, but in a kind of literal way, wild is sentenced to two years of hard labor, right? So my my reading of this is that on the, on the one hand, Carpenter's really annoyed by the wild trial because it, it interrupts the work he wants to do. Right? It, it physically, it literally means that he can't publish the book he wants to publish. In a positive way, though, I think it forces him then to, to think, well, what's a better argument that we can make? Right? What, I mean, if that one doesn't seem to be working, right, and with all of its sort of ancient cultural lineage, right? What's the better argument we can make? And I think then he goes back to some of those German sources and thinks about them differently. And he's certainly, you can sort of see, even in some of the small changes he's making in his manuscript, um, he's making a different kind of argument about, um, about to what extent the advocacy for homosexuality has to has to entertain the possibility of physical relations and not just intellectual ones, right? That 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 argument that that what this was all about was the kind of the channeling of desire into philosophical thought or artistic creation um, was always a bit of a, a myth to begin with, right? Or a bit of an alibi. And I think what Carpenter does in in the, in the work that he publishes after the Wild Trial is kind of acknowledge that much more clearly. And so it's a different kind of advocacy work that he's doing afterwards. And so for me, that's the positive benefit of the Wild Trial, right? Is almost kind of in, in creating that necessary pause. It allows Carpenter to kind of go back to the drawing board and and think through his ideas in a in a different way. And uh, at the, there is another important trial that happened in eighteen seventy and seventy one trial of Stella Bolton and um, Fanny Park. And part of your argument is that this trial uh, paved the way for a trans woman subjectivity or identity. Can you tell us who they were and how? Did the trial come about and how did it pave the way for this new identity to emerge? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in, in one way, it, it's not it's not anything new, I think. Like, I mean, the, the research you do, there there are countless cases of people who are a firm male at birth who dress, mm. who identify as women and dress as women and get arrested for it. Right, all the way through the 19th century. Right, I mean, I, 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 I've sort of traced a sort of history of of, of that. Um, that, but the Fanny and Stella trial is the most public one of those, and it's partly because they they are from what we would think of as the kind of upper middle class. Mm. Um, and so after they get arrested, they have the kind of the the resources to then uh, contest those charges in a jury trial. And in the ninth century, if you have a jury trial, every word of that trial has to get written down and recorded. And so we have this incredible about a thousand page record of everything that's said in the trial and all of the evidence that's 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 given to it, which includes letters and photographs. And so it's incredibly rich archive. But in in other ways, it's 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 very much a kind of common occurrence in some ways. So what tends to happen is that that people get arrested for wearing women's clothes and they get charged under sodomy laws, right? Because again, the 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 assumption has always been that gender nonconformity really means sexual nonconformity, right? Um, and in or or so they're either charged with sodomy laws or prostitution laws. In some cases those are the same thing, right? That the, they're they're dressing this way in order to entice other men into sex. Right, whether for money or for pleasure, in some ways it doesn't really matter. Right, um, and some of those prosecutions historically were successful, and some of them weren't. Right, um, but in the case of Fanny and Stella's, this thing goes on for for a year and a half. Um, they, I mean, in some ways, it's it's the most painful document to read because a lot of it it hinges on on medical testimony about their bodies and and what what you know. They're these sort of invasive um, 
sort of investigations of them that's looking at the the shape of their anus and the shape of their penis and right and trying in some ways to kind of read what sex sexual life they've lived on the you know on the basis of their bodies um prosecution doctors and defense doctors like some of the most important doctors of the period testify in this trial and ultimately they are acquitted of of the the felony charges and the only thing that they end up being prosecuted for is disturbing the peace which is honestly the the thing that was always the case to begin with right you know you make a public spectacle in the streets of london you can be prosecuted for disturbing the peace it's a sort of slap on the wrist you know misdemeanor and, and you have to pay a small fine and say you'll you'll behave yourself for you know a period of time and you know and so the for me the trial is interesting because it it's the most sort of public and kind of readable moment in which that tendency to kind of lump these categories together fails right because what it's trying to do is in some ways follow the almost kind of reverse the logic of Ulrich, right if, if Ulrich says sexual non-normativity is necessarily going to express itself in terms of gender non-normativity. The trial of Annie and Stella in some ways tries to do that in reverse and say any signs of gender non-normativity have to be signs of sexual non-normativity, right? So dressing as women means that you have to be gay men, in effect, right? And I think the, the failure of the trial is in some ways a kind of a nail in the coffin of that idea, right? Or a sort of first little blow to that idea because it's such a public trial and gets such big coverage that, you know, so the obvious question, I mean, it's not necessarily, I don't think it's, you could say in kind of simple terms, therefore they are trans women. But I think what the trial opens up is, is a space in which you can imagine a possibility for what it would mean to be a trans woman in the 19th century. Um, because the other thing about Fenn and Stella that I think is really significant is that we have such rich documentary evidence of the lives that they live because it's all entered into, into the trial record. So the letters between them, you know, just to give you an example, are, are some of the first recorded uses of, of the, word, the terms camp and drag in English come from that trial record. Uh, there's a photographic record of them that exists over a long period of time so we can document basically you know the sort of persistence of of a kind of gender presentation right so um i, I give a couple of examples in the book uh stella is photographed so she they're, they're both involved in acting um so she's photographed in a place called scarborough on with one of those sort of coastal resorts in england by somebody called olivier sarony um, who then testifies in the trial as to, you know, because she's photographed in, in, in dress and wig and the whole works, right? Um, after she's acquitted, 10 years later, she, both she and uh, Fanny go to New York because their reputation is, you know, pretty much, you know, hard to, it's hard to go back on the stage in London after this very public trial. They both go to America. Um, Stella then gets photographed by... Olivier Sarony's brother, Napoleon Sarony in New York, he he is the, the premier portrait photographer for actresses on Broadway. And he's also the person who takes all the famous photographs of, of Oscar Wilde uh, on his American tour. So almost any image that you can probably picture in your head of what Oscar Wilde looked like comes from these two sittings he did with Napoleon Sarony uh, in New York. And so, but those two sets of photographs are about 15 years apart and so you can so you can think you know again if, if one of the ways in which we might define a trans identity is the persistent and insistent uh desire to um to present a particular kind of gender identity that's absolutely something you can see in those photographs right but yeah so i think you know again to the extent that trans scholars are looking at exactly looking for evidence of that kind of gender presentation, I think this is one of the places where you could very clearly see it.
if I had photographs of Frederica Blanc, I would make the same argument, I think. But I mean, there's there's no there's no way beyond Ulrich's language to imagine the life of Frederica Blanc. But but Fanny and Stella, we have an incredibly rich documentary archive of their lives. Um, let me just ask you a final question. So you've written this book about uh, LGBT community in Victorian England. And as I said at the beginning, it sounds really, really familiar with a lot of arguments that we're making today. So how do you think this book or some of the cases you put forth in the book help us better engage and understand the current debates around uh, this community? Mm, yeah. Um, well, I think some of the things I've already kind of touched on, I think, it is, is, I mean, one thing is very clear to say, these are not new things that we're dealing with. Right. These these are things that that people have encountered before and and thought about ways to 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 handle respectfully and right, you know, and acknowledging the rights of people. Um, and that's not something we always think about, you know, Victorian England as being a place that does that. But you know, to give one example, um, newspapers all refer to Fanny and Stella as she and her. Right. And they, this was not a problem for them at all. Right, you know, e even the sort of tabloid, the equivalent of tabloid newspapers of the time, recognized that it made no sense to refer to them by male pronouns, even though in court they were dressed in suits and right. Um, so, you know, to the extent that this feels like such a hard thing for people now, that was something that that you know tabloid journalists in the 1860s could do relatively easily. You know, there's another moment. Um, the other moment I, I forgot to mention is that they get arrested because one of them, it's um, like Fanny goes into a restroom to fix her dress at a theater. Mm -hmm. And so they're arrested on, on coming out of there. Uh, and so in some ways, this is a version of, of our bathroom debates. And what their lawyers say is dress the way they were, which, which restroom would you have expected them to go into given what they were wearing? And you could see in the photographs, right? And and the court absolutely accepts that. It's like yes, okay, that makes a lot of sense to us. So, you know, so again, all the things that we now agonize over and debate, you know, and certainly in the U.S. have an incredibly polarized political divisions about about trans people are things that have existed in the past. So I think that that's kind of useful in itself. Right? I think the other thing is is to sort of to go back to thinking about movements, right? Like like partly I think because of that backlash against trans people, which seems to have kind of picked up, especially with a kind of acceptance of particularly marriage equality. So as kind of particularly sort of settled couple gay men and lesbians become socially acceptable, then the kind of, you know, the the backlash has moved instead onto trans people. Right. And so so I think in some ways the 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 tension in that coalition is coming out of external forces, right? You know, and so you have that that idea of kind of wanting to separate out again because, in some ways, you know, trans people bring a certain kind of baggage and a certain kind of um, attention that there are a lot of people in the lesbian gay movement don't want. Right? Um, so to be able to kind of think historically about the ways in which these people existed together and were in some ways the kind of frame of reference by which our definitions came into being to begin with, I think is a just a valuable sort of way of saying trans people have always been there since the start, right? That um and the idea of kind of responding to that conservative backlash by by wanting to push them out of a movement seemed short sighted and you know and reactive. And instead, you know, there are ways in which we can think about why L, G, B, and T, and I, and Q were in a kind of alliance together in the first place, right? And in lots of ways, the 19th century gives us some tools for thinking about that. They're not perfect tools. Like, there are all kinds of, of you know, um, things that don't work, particularly the kind of gender binary stuff that we were talking about. But the willingness to think about what these people had in common. I think is a is for me a, a, is the most valuable lesson. Yeah. Um, is there any other project or book you're currently working on? Yeah, I sort of have a follow up on this, which which is about Ireland. Um, yeah, which which is sort of you know if, if this is sort of a book about England in particular, I think the follow up is to try and kind of 
think a little bit about how some of these ideas look different in particularly 19th and early 20th century Ireland. Mm. And so that's kind of where I think I'm going to, I'm kind of moving with this because it, it's sort of interesting because for me, as we were talking about earlier, it makes a lot of sense that a lot of these debates happen in England because England is the dominant imperial superpower. Um, but I, in Wilde is, uh, you know, in some ways in both of these books, but, you know, it, it's not just Wilde. There are all kinds of Irish figures of this period in for whom we can find exactly some of these same debates happening. But of course, those debates happen very differently because they're they're kind of they're typically in relation to mm. forms of Irish nationalism and anti-colonial thinking. So, so I kind of want I think that's where I'm going next, because, I you know, that's. That's how I want to kind of reposition Wilde, I think, and kind of mm. take him out of the, mm. this kind of English context and mm. and put him into an Irish one and, and kind of try and understand, well, so how can these same arguments work for an anti-colonial nationalism, right? And in some ways they work differently, but they, they use a lot of the same reference points. Mm. So I'm, I'm working right now on, on ways in which Irish people also went back to the ancient Greeks and tried to find a kind of common ground, but it's it's a very different common ground because it's not the common ground of being imperial colonizers, right? It's it's in some <laughs> ways it's an identification that's more about being um, on the at the other end of of colonization. No. Yeah. So the Irish tend to think, okay, so there's the there's the bad Romans and there's the good Greeks and and we're like the Greeks and the English are like the Romans and so and it's kind of just it's yeah it's a sort of interesting re reworking of all the same mm. material but mm. for different ends. So that's I'm at the very beginning of thinking about that, but I think that's where I'm I'm heading. Yeah. Well, hopefully we'll be able to talk to you about your new book in a year or so when whenever it's out. I, I maybe not that soon, but yes, yeah. <laughs> Dr. Simon Joyce, thank you very, very much for giving us your time and talking to us about this wonderful book. As you mentioned uh, throughout the interview, there are lots and lots of fascinating cases in the book which can give us some really good tools, you know, to 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 better engage with these arguments today. Um, and you know, as the saying goes, I guess history, history is always serves as a guide to us. Thank you yeah, very much yeah. for your time. Okay, thank you for inviting me. These are wonderful questions, and it's really great to talk to you. Yeah.